So welcome to this episode of the Leadersmith Podcast. I am joined again by Jim Kane. Jim Kane was on a previous uh, episode, and he's going to be talking about how he's had to make a pivot uh, during the COVID crisis in order to keep doing his business the way that he wants to be able to impact others. Stay tuned. In a world of incompetent bosses, micromanagers, and petty tyrants, you are listening to The Leadersmith. Now, here is your host, Darren Gertis. Okay, so Jim Kane is with us again, and Jim, uh, he's the author of 21 books. Uh, he's he's a trainer. He'll go and and uh, either do things outside, uh, outdoors, or at a corporate retreat, but everything is interactional for him, and that was the case until COVID hit, and now he has to adjust. Now he has to pivot because if everything that you do depends on interacting with others and having to move around and do activities, that's got to be a tricky thing to do virtually, right? It was initially. In fact, Darren, if you had asked me in February if I would lead a virtual event, I probably would have turned down the offer and pointed you towards people who were more well versed in this this field. So tell me what happened. Like, (laughs) tell me about what you were doing, like describe so that people understand how uh, experience based everything was. Uh, Tell us that first and then how we had to pivot. Prior to COVID, um, I work in a very... um, interesting field of experiential learning. We we learn by doing. Some people uh, look at things like ropes courses or team building programs or outdoor adventure. Um, Quite frankly, I'll use any technique I can. I'll use a group cooking project to get people to work together and make something positive happen. But I work mostly in the team building field. Um, And in early March this year, I actually spoke at a major conference. We had 60, 80 people in person in in a small room interacting with each other and had a brilliant experience. Um, and just about a week later, I came back from a, an experience and everything stopped. I, I had a trip to Iceland planned to do some training there. I had some international events this year, a series of staff trainings, and literally everything stopped overnight. And I said, okay, well, what needs to happen now is the only way to move beyond um, this idea of doing an in-person training is to do something um, that's not in direct contact. And luckily mm-hmm. we had resources like Zoom and WebEx and a lot of the uh, computer-based programs, um, FaceTime, WeChat, all those type of things uh, were available. It's nice that that technology preceded the need for it. I mean, <laughs> it wasn't that on time, right? I mean, yeah, kind of thinking, you know, I, I don't know why we need this, but okay, it's there. Well, guess what? We we really needed it. So I got together with a group of friends that was started by a guy named John Berkeley in North Carolina and uh, a guy named John Losey in California. And we created what we called a virtual facilitation practice group. We said, okay, we don't know much about this virtual stuff yet. Let's find out and let's actually practice. So we put people in Zoom rooms and online and people would bring stuff in. They'd say, okay, I want to try this activity. And they would take something from the real world and they would transition it to the virtual world. Mm -hmm. Some things like icebreakers transition pretty easily. But a ropes course experience, uh, it's not so easy to do. So we looked at things we could do that were very visual, that would easily translate, and people began the process of practicing. Well, after about two months, we got to be reasonably good. And and here was the question that was being focused by most of the corporate world. They said, okay, we can't get together in real life, so what can we do? And they were open to any of the possibilities. And some people got to the point where they practiced using virtual techniques, and that became the possibility. And they got better as they practiced. The same way when we first started facilitating team building in real life, we got better as we practiced. So can you give me an example of something that translates and maybe something that doesn't? Okay. Um, As I mentioned, a ropes course experience or something that's extremely physical doesn't necessarily translate. But I can get people up out of their seats and interacting. Communication does. So group problem solving. If we can all look at one screen that shows the puzzle, so to speak, and the rest of us can all see it we can offer ideas and that can be manipulated. So some things can happen on screen. In fact, um, here, let me me just give you a quick example of one that's uh, that's really kind of fun. I'm gonna put this on here and I'll share a screen just quickly so you can see it. This one is really simple. I put a rope on the ground and I asked people if I pulled the ends of the rope, it would form a knot or a straight line. So it's a visual puzzle and this particular configuration tends to get people on both sides. If I pull the ends where the blue arrows are, is it a knot or is it a straight line? So this is something I do in the real world that I can also use as a graphic in the virtual world. 
And then I have a video of this that I can actually show myself pulling it. If you had a third camera in your particular um, presentation software, you could do it in real time in front of groups. But yeah, that's so an activity where we try to get people to make a decision. What are you trying to teach with that not rope pull question? I can tell you this. When I, when I ask people to step on the left if they believe it's a knot or the right if it's a straight line, I get people on both sides. And now you've got the storming stage of group formation. Great. Yeah. So now you can start to see, well, different people have different perspectives. And we need to build consensus. So how do we get everybody on the same line? And what I do is I partner a person from the right and the left, not straight line. And I make them work as a team, and then they have to come to consensus individually. They so it's essentially, it's essentially the opposite of Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> In this case, it's not every voice, but how do we, you know, how do we reach agreement as a corporation? Maybe we have a major decision to make in the future, and it's not a question of right or wrong, but it's a question of we can do Plan A or Plan B. Yeah. And the thing is, if I'm a Plan A guy and you're a Plan B guy, Darren. I'm not sure I want to do plan B, but tell me why you think that's important. And that's the beginning of this process of conflict resolution, of working together, is understanding the other side's point of view. So we can do that in virtual space the same way we do that in real life. That's an okay. example. You've got to give us some other examples of how to do this. And there is a reason why I'm going there and asking you to give a, a, a multiple uh, a multiple examples, because there are people out here that that their their whole business model is shifted. It is changed. It's been Absolutely. shattered. And now they have to do it online. Like for me as a teacher in a classroom, I can just kind of put on my PowerPoint and teach. It's, it's pretty seamless for me. But for some people, it's hard to wrap your mind around how you're going to do this. I talked to, I mean, I not talked to, I read about, this was uh, Adam Grant's podcast, um, read and listened to him talking about how he, uh, there was a plumber doing virtual plumbing, but what he was doing was instructing, like, call me up, we're on a Zoom meeting, show me what's going on, I'll teach you how to snake the pipes and whatever else. I mean, it's amazing, but people have to pivot because circumstances require them to pivot. <laughs> I would far rather be with my students. Yeah, pivot. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would far rather be with my students than online. But if I have to be online, and mercifully, I'm in the class right now. But if it happens again and I have to be online, I'm going to pivot. I'm going to make it the best experience possible. So give me some other examples of, of uh, some of the ones that have worked really well for you. Some of the activities are what I consider the low-hanging fruit. They're pretty easy to make the transition. That red rope activity from whether it's a not or straight line that's pretty simple to move to virtual space and taking a picture of it compared to what happens in real space. So right. that's an example of the low hanging fruit. There are ones that are a little bit more complicated. Um, I'll share one with you. That's been a kind of a fun one that I use recently. There's a, a team building activity that creates what I call win win scenario. And if you consider this uh, collection of 24 spaces, think of it like a Coca-Cola case where we right. can put four six packs in there. And these are tennis balls. And in real life, or in the real world, I have an actual wooden Coca-Cola bottle case. And I ask teams to place balls one at a time. And the goal is to get four balls in a row. Well, what happens is people think they're playing Connect Four, and they start blocking their opponent in real life. Okay. And so at the end of the configuration, once all the, the holes are filled, um, they might get one or two four-in-a-row patterns, but they don't get the maximum. This is designed, for example, that if they work collaboratively and they work together, they each could have just, side can score as. Yeah, they could have just done, you know, if they, they, they could have, I, I think I had an aha moment where uh, they yeah. could have just simply all done, they, they could have maximized it where, how many are there? They could have had uh, four, by two, they could have each had 12. All connected if they had worked together collaboratively. If they worked together, but there's this there's this common underlying thing, and I did this probably 20 times this summer. Um, and in 20 out of 20 cases, people competed the first round, and then they looked for ways to say, okay, now we need to try something different because we only got you know a maximum of three. You can get double that number if you work together, you know. And they're like, oh, so they start sharing other ideas. So this is the next level. The first level is the low hanging fruit. The next level is things that are still possible. The third level would be actually creating things in virtual space that don't exist in the real world. Okay. I see virtual world's great. There's no gravity. The laws of physics don't apply. You can bend a lot of rules. <laughs> I use that line from the, the matrix that Neo um, does when he's first fighting Morpheus in this dojo. He says, you have to remember the rules of a computer system, you know, they can be bent, they can be broken. 
you know, so the virtual space is like that. Things that are not possible in the real world. For example, just getting people around the world connected on a phone call is pretty amazing technology. Mm -hmm. Darren, you're probably at the age I am. When I was a kid and I had long distance charges every month, my parents would say, you owe us $2.35 for long distance. People don't even know what long distance is anymore. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, and, and now we can talk around the world. So the idea was to, and here, here's, I think, the most brilliant statement of the whole shift um, from real world to virtual world. A virtual activity does not replicate a real world activity. It yeah. replicates the outcome. Wow, so that's, that's deep. A virtual conference does not replace a real person conference. It replaces the outcome. In other words, why were we getting together to begin with? That's what we want to replicate in virtual space. So when you get over trying to just turn a real world activity into a virtual activity, you think, okay, the whole goal of this activity was to get them to communicate. I can do that in other ways in virtual space and replicate the outcome, not the actual activity. And that leaves the doors open for lots of possibilities. It's amazing to me that you see uh, blue oceans in this. I mean, you you see an expansive <laughs> something rather than, oh, you know, most people are seeing it like I used to do this and now I'm locked down into this small virtual space. But you're seeing all kinds of additional possibilities here. Uh, because here's, of the, here's the really interesting thing. I did a program about a week ago and someone said, oh, but you're an expert in this. And I said, no. We're just 15 minutes ahead of you. <laughs> That's right. It doesn't take a lot to figure out, you know, once you get a basic video program, I, I happen to use Zoom a lot. I've done Microsoft Office. I've done some other type of things, WebEx and stuff like that. But I use Zoom primarily. Um, once you get a vehicle and you explore all that it can do, then you just need to get in there and literally start pushing buttons. And I have a friend who says, try to break it. Do everything you possibly can because you can always reset it and try again. But Go in, find the platform you want to use, and then quit trying to replicate activities and start replicating the outcomes. And that's try to break. Possible. Try to break it is good advice. Um, you, <laughs> this this will warm your heart. But when I was first taught the sail, little sail sailboat, little sunfish, you, I was told push it until it you topple over. That's great advice because then you know where the line is before <laughs> you're going to get knocked over. And so and it's hard. I mean, it takes a little work to do that. So it, it, it allays your fear when you push it to you. You can break it. Now you know where the line is and <laughs> you're in good shape. Well, and I'll give you another analogy that comes from that. When the America's Cup team lost the America's Cup to Australia and they had to go and gain it back. Um, and there's a movie by the name of Wind with Matthew Modine and uh, it's in it. But anyways, um, they did, when they, they trained, they would do what they called breakdown. They would push and push and push until something went wrong. I said, okay, what went wrong? It's like, wow. well, I couldn't operate the winch and do this. Okay. And they would figure out how to do it. And they'd go out and they'd go out in the worst days of weather and push and push until they broke down and they would figure out how to solve that problem. So rather than just trying to do things perfect all the time, they pushed it to the point where they could make things happen by when things went wrong. Yeah, that's that's great advice. Hey, what advice would you give people like so you're an insurance agent and your job has been to sit down over a cup of coffee and meet with people and now you're reduced to a Zoom uh meeting. What advice would you give to these professionals who are now in stuck in I mean, cuz you really have overcome far more than they have. Right? Yeah. I mean, so so is there a mentality advice or or some kind of um uh, additional advice that you can can provide them? One of the first phrases that I learned was connection before content. Mm -hmm. um, for example, you and I, when we started this podcast today, had a little conversation. We were just chatting about stuff. We we mentioned we both have books in our library and you know, we found commonalities. That connection is important because literally, I, I don't know who the person is on the other side of the screen. Right. So finding out that they have empathy for me or they know something about me, I know something about them creates a level of contact. Maybe it's not the same that you would get in an in-person, but it's all we have. You know, people use the phrase, if I had a choice, I would always choose an in-person interaction. Sure. Yeah. This is what we have to work with. So for people who have to, you know, try to create virtually what they did in the real life is don't forget about the connection before content. Piece. Before you get into the meaning and the reason for this meeting, let's interact with people just a bit. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, that is excellent advice. Hey, tell us, um, 
you know, if, if people are interested in the resource that you have, what resources are useful for doing, the, you know, team building kind of exercises, even now, even virtually? And then tell us again about the virtual resources so that people can, uh, under, you know, just have other resources at their fingertips. Well, here's an example. Um, this summer with a virtual facilitation practice group, um, 29 of us wrote a book in four weeks. We wanted to get something out that people could use as a resource and as a reference. Um, and we call it the learning curve, trying to making the transition from real world to virtual world. Um, and we put together this list. Now, I'll share with you early on in my experience, when I, um, when I first started creating graphics for virtual presentations, I used high resolution, you know, high bandwidth graphics, and there wasn't the bandwidth. I had people who were using dial-up to access the call. Mm -hmm. And they literally could not see the photograph. So we, some of the things that are in the learning curve as a book were mistakes we made early on. You mm -hmm. know, we try to do it with too many people in the room. Team building virtually, I would say six to eight people is the optimum size. You start getting 25 people, you'll never hear some of them. You can do icebreakers. You can do other group activities with them. But part of team building and that work is to get people to communicate and to hear the voices in the room. And once you get above about 10 people on a call, you really can't hear all the voices. Yeah. So if you if you have to have a large group, break them into breakout groups. If you, if you have that accessibility or something, is that is that what I'm hearing? Yeah. Or just organize the event. So at, here's why well, I worked with one company this summer. They had about 120 employees. We did 14 different workshops mm -hmm. for 90 minutes each because wow. then we can have six to eight to 10 people in one workshop. 120 would just be. You could have an experience. I'm not saying you can't do large groups. I, I did a group of 150 in a university recently, but it's a different scenario. It, it plays differently. You won't get the same bonding you do with that many people in a virtual format. I understand. So, same, same the platform. You, I mean, yeah. you can really minister to so many people at a time in, in a real deep way where you can get into their experiences and, and cold, you know, what is important to them. That's right. And maybe here's the best advice. Don't be afraid to make mistakes. You know, I, I when I did this first, we did a pilot session for the first team building program I did virtually, and these high resolution graphics just crashed. So mm -hmm. instead of having this three dimensional, beautifully rendered tennis ball, I made a yellow circle, and it did exactly the same <laughs> thing, and and, and it, it met the needs of the group. So we, I learned by making mistakes. And if you're afraid to make mistakes, the virtual world is not a good place to be because you're gonna almost every session I've done, something went wrong. People lost power. You know, the, the signal dropped, the Wi-Fi bandwidth, you know, diminished. Um, somebody didn't get a resource they needed. You know, that's that's an upside. You were talking about the upside of you don't have the limits of time and space like the Matrix. But another upside is you shouldn't be afraid to like, OK, be before this, I was talking about, hey, I got to go tell my kids to be quiet. But, you know, honestly, if they're screaming in the background, OK, I mean, we recognize that I'm not a professional in a studio, like, you know, being, ho you know, I'm not hosting the tonight show, even at the night show or what is it? The daily show is in the guy's home or we, right. I mean, it's, we, we're, we're, we can be more comfortable with being more comfortable now where in February, we wouldn't have thought that way, but as of March, wow, we're all kind of doing that. So it, it it just it just changes the dynamic significantly to realize like you know it's, this is where we are this is my home office it's you know it's not perfect so yeah that that's that's good stuff i always encourage new facilitators the number one hint i give people is to be authentic to be themselves not yeah. to try to replicate you know try to be like another person or i learned this activity from so and so so i teach it exactly the same way this, this is pretty authentic this this is who i am i can see a lot about who you are, Darren. And I think just sharing that part with your people and maybe to some extent being a little vulnerable to your audience. And when things go wrong and say, oh, that didn't work, you know, and just owning it and moving on. But people seem a little more forgiving than they would for a professionally formatted event um, where you expect, you know. Right. For yeah, that's different. what I mean. Exactly. You know, hey, our humanity so comes out. <laughs> that's right. So, so tell me, um, how has the pivot been? Like, you had a pivot. We we didn't want to do virtual, but virtual has to be the way. So how's that been compared to where you were before? Uh, now, we have a few months under our belt, right? Because, you know, uh, this is better than half a year now since we had a pivot. What's that been like? Has it been as successful, partly successful? Is it do you, do you see it becoming more potentially successful or when when we when it lifts, being able to do both wings now? 
probably this is kind of a, a specific issue for me is a lot of people are able to do a virtual thing, but haven't figured out how to monetize it. In other words, they were paid as a facilitator, as a teacher, as a trainer, right. but the ability to do this and make an income, especially for people nowadays who maybe don't qualify for unemployment or, you know, federal funding and things like this, they want to find a way to make, you know, a living for themselves and their families. Um, that can be challenging. Yeah. Um, so in your line of work, or you're able to do this. Has it, has it been ever, has it been what you would hope it would have been? I mean, or are you still working at it and trying to make it, make it fly? I don't think anybody gets to the point where they can say, okay, I've learned enough. I'm ready. I'm done. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a master facilitator in virtual space mm -hmm. because here's an example. Zoom is now going to pour Mural into their, they, they call it a Zap. It's a Zoom app. Um, okay. And now Mural is going to be part of Zoom and you'll be able to do it internally. Software is going to get better. New resources are going to continue to emerge. And with them comes capabilities of things we can't do currently. Mm -hmm. For example, um, a digital signature. How do you sign off on something in virtual space? You know, the, the, our abilities to do that are going to increase and grow. Yeah. So you're, you're hitting a moving target. It's yeah, going to continue to expand. Yeah, I, I saw this too where, you know, you, you said earlier in February you would never thought of doing this. So I have this extra hat at, at uh, Charleston Southern where I teach where I'm the director of instructional technology, which means if you have a problem teaching online, you come see me and, uh, you know, I help you with it. So normally what I would do is they'd send me an email, I'd drop what I'm doing, go over to their office, work the thing out, and voila, they're happy. It wasn't that hard. But it changed, right? And then I was like slammed for the for you know until the end of the major semester, and then it eased up in the summer. But what I learned in that short couple months was we we made like three, maybe four years worth of progress in three months, right? <laughs> I mean, it sure. would be like pulling teeth to get them to come to a training before, and now they're tell me what I need to do. I, I, I want to learn. I, you know, help me with this. And so they, we learned, by, we grew by leaps and bounds um, because we were forced to. And um, it, it's a, it's a high cost way of doing it, but we, we've grown a lot. And, and uh, I think this, the new normal is going to be, even if everything lifts, if you got a, a pill tomorrow that would make everything go away, we still like I still kind of dig going to church in my living room, like watching it on TV. I mean, I, I still don't like talking to the Domino's guy um, if I can avoid any contact at all. I, so you know, I think there's going to be a lot of change like that where society has now shifted and we have to adjust to this new normal. And those that are proactive like you and those people that did this with the virtual stuff they're going to be the ones that are successful. It's the laggards that are going to have a hard time catching up because these these uh, early adopters like you are going to be very, very successful. I actually use the popcorn analogy. You know, the first kernels of pop are the early adopters. Uh -huh. There's a bunch of people kind of in the middle. There's a few that do it way right at the very end. They, they kind of wait to make their decision until there's no other choice. And some never pop. They, they never convert from real world to virtual world. Yeah. Um, and, and here's probably a phrase that we can look forward with, and maybe this is the important quote for this podcast. Um, we can't put the genie back in the bottle. Yeah. Now that we've been exposed to virtual, if you were a corporate leader in two years and you said, well, you know what? We could pay for everybody to fly to that, but that's like 300 people. Why don't we just do a virtual event, you know, the cost benefit? So I believe virtual is going to continue to be with us. Will it be with us as much as it is now once we're allowed to do real world? No, I think real world events will take place. Yeah. But I don't know that we're going to revert back to the way it was before. If before oh. we were 90% real world, 10% virtual, and now we're about 90 plus percent virtual, I don't think we're going back to the way it was before. But I think both of those will continue to go hand in hand or maybe you know, we pull people together virtually. We do these hybrid events where we get the local people and then all the distant people come in virtually. They're happy. They don't have to spend a thousand dollars on airfare to get there. And we still get the job done. So I think it's going to be with us for a while. So my advice to want to be virtual facilitators, teachers or trainers is start practicing and making mistakes now because this is going to be around for a while. Yeah, that is good advice. I was thinking not just virtual, but things like working at home. 
if you roll back the clock until you know February or January, working at home, well, we can't do that. Look, I homeschool. Homeschool, we can't do that. Well, now you know you can, right? So it's it's the same kind of thing. So um, okay. Anyway, we, we've spent our time. I really am I'm grateful that that you've uh, come on the podcast to share that with us because that's going to be very encouraging, regardless of the line of work people are in. If they have to mediate through a new technology that you know used to just be direct and relational, because going from a ropes course to this is quite a challenge. It, it's hard to argue like, well, I can't do my insurance sales online. He can do a, you know, the, the equivalent of what the ropes course was here. So um, anyway, I'll, I'll share two pieces as we sign up. Number one, I talked over the telephone, my 83 year old mother into how to download Zoom for her iPad. <laughs> I can see her awesome. face with my aunt so I can make that happen. And, uh, and the second piece is I placed some virtual activities on my website at teamworkandteamplay.com. If you mm-hmm. click on the downloads, You'll find some things you can do in the virtual space. Okay. And I was just about to ask you, teamworkandteamplay.com. That's where you want to send people if they want to follow up. Anything else about virtual space? Any other, uh, like your book is going to be out when? The the virtual book that you were just describing. End of this month, November. So by December 1st, the uh, the learning curve should be available through learn- Amazon and acabookstore.com. Okay. The learning curve. All right. Well, thank you. I always close with a quotation for contemplation. And what came to my mind was a quote by John Wooden, where he said, the most uh, powerful leadership tool you have in your is your own personal example. And that's what you're doing right now. You are teaching by your own personal example. Yes, it can be done. And if he can do this with all these experiential kind of teaching, you can do this with whatever it is that you're doing. So, hey, Jim, thank you so much for coming back on the show. I really appreciate it.